Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kamak, for that very uh, thought-provoking presentation. Now the floor is open for questions. We have about 15 minutes for questions or comments from the audience. Uh, I don't think we need a microphone, so anybody can just stand up and give his or her comments or questions. Okay. Yeah, I uh, didn't uh, want to miss this opportunity to ask a question because I have a fourth plus class. Uh, Paul, thank you for your stimulating talk. Uh, actually, you uh, stimulated a number of ideas. I'm trying to organize them by now. Uh, first, your uh, overall framework. You seem to belong to a school of thought, of course, which argues that a better understanding of developments in the global economy has to do with uh, understanding the uh, development of the forces of production. Now that view, however, as pointed out by many critics, seem to completely ignore or underplay the role of agency in history. Okay? And I was uh, curious how you would respond to this criticism. And I, I bring that to a to a different interpretation of what has taken place in light of the global financial crisis, which you seem to underplay. No? There is a different interpretation which says that the, uh, what, what is unique in this conjuncture of capitalist development is the role of unproductive finance capital, speculative finance capital, what we see invested in stock markets, what some critics would refer to as casino capitalism. And that is unproductive, and it has led to a lot of stagnation. The kind of stagnation which has hit, of course, uh, the US, uh, Europe, and even the BRICS, uh, the, the, the countries that you have mentioned as now uh, committed to rapid uh, capitalist industrialization. I, I was curious about, for instance, we all know what is happening in Brazil, right? It has been touted as the poster, uh, poster boy or whatever of, uh, uh, of dynamic capitalism. And we know what is happening there right now uh, in, in light of neoliberal capitalism. So uh, uh, that's a counter uh, argument to, to what seems to be your overall uh, framework that it's really nothing if we take a look at the overall <coughs> development of the forces of production. Who knows, you may be right, but again, it would seem to underplay, as I said earlier, the role of agency and how do, you, how do we take advantage of major contradictions and opportunities offered at particular points in the crisis. You know? After all, uh, of course, you're a Latin American specialist and we all know what sort of uh, mass movements the contradictions of neoliberal capitalism has bred. You know? Now, of course, uh, whether this will ultimately succeed as revolutionary challenges to capitalism is another <coughs> question. But at least it makes us sensitive to important uh, conjunctural struggles, which uh, might uh, lead to, if not an actual revolutionary challenge, at least to opportunities that can force significant reforms. You know? Uh, sec uh, second or third point, and I will stop with this. I think we also need to take into consideration the uh, changes that modern capitalism has undergone itself. No? Uh, the, the capitalism that Marx spoke of, I think, uh, 100, more than 100 years ago, is not the capitalism that we see now. The role, the impact of technology, Marx obviously could not have anticipated many of the developments in technology. The, the fact that even in capitalist, in so-called capitalist economies, we now see very interesting combinations of state control over the productive forces and private capital. Whereas the old notion of capitalism simply argued that, well, you have capitalism when you have private uh, markets and private control uh, of property. But I think that is no longer the case. And I, I, and, I, and I was, uh, your, your observation about the agents of capitalism like the ADB and all these other banks, now actually not just tolerating but even proposing 
the need for industrial in, in, industrial what is this strategy <coughs> industrial transformation <coughs> is another uh, interesting uh, development in modern day capitalism I think what that shows it it provides it may provide opportunities for an easier understanding that significant changes may take place. We don't have to wait till the well, forces of production has fully developed. Now, who knows, that might take place a thousand years from now, when all of us shall have been dead, of course, to, to paraphrase another famous theory. OK, thank you. OK, excellent comment. Thank you. Um, very briefly, so that people can chip in. Um, I think I, I largely agree. Um, I've, I've focused on one side of agency. Obviously, I'm, I'm very keen to, not, not only to emphasize agency on behalf of global capital, but to identify the agents. So I don't think that's a kind of mechanical process that happens outside of agency. And of course, you're right, I haven't talked about uh, counter hegemonic movements. But the same, I think well, what the, the lesson I would be hoping to the, the point I'll be trying to make is don't underestimate the agents of capital. They do have a coherent, rational plan. It does make sense in terms of classical political economy and Marx's critique of it. So the strategies that we might have to adopt to challenge it, they're tough. And if you just take one example from your comment, reforms. We, we say, well, I'm talking about the, the revolutionary or radical left, we face with a dilemma because many of the reforms that are prominent today in social, trans in social protection, giving safety nets, providing basic income to the unemployed in poor Asian countries, even, even conditional cash transfers that enable girls to stay at school and so on, they do have real benefits for poor people. So the problem at the moment is, as has often been the case in the history of capitalism so far, pushing for reforms may be part of a dialectical process that strengthens capital for the time being as much as it weakens it. So it causes all kinds of dilemmas. And the other thing I'll say is, yeah, I think that, that, that unproductive capital is fine. It comes and goes. It gets, it disappears, and then some. So I think that's a cyclical thing. I'm not very worried about unproductive capital coming and going over time. And as, and as regards the development of the BRICS, of course you're right. It's not easy. The whole, you, you'll know, the whole debate in China at the moment is how do we move away from being a low productivity assembly operation, organized economy, to being one based on innovation and greater levels of uh, uh, application of technology. That's just in Lim's line at the World Bank, and it's really tough transition to manage. And the ADB writes loads of stuff about this, and it always says the only country in Asia that managed to make the transition from a promising industrial economy to an advanced industrial economy was Korea. So don't think it's easy. It's tough. So I think the same kind of issues. I'll stop. Other questions? Any comments uh, in the back? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'm just struck by your comment that uh, you know, we can, or a suggestion that we can forget the global financial crisis. But we know, for example, from the classic Marxist text, that uh, um, crisis is inevitable mm -hmm. in the capitalist system. And uh, uh, it is this crisis, whether you view it from the overproduction or the underconsumption side, as the classical Marxist debates uh, went uh, during uh, the early times. And uh, it has always been, uh, well, I think, a, con a constant or a consistent Trend in the analysis of Marx and later Marxist thinkers that capital cannot just correct itself, including the markets. And so the state has to periodically intervene in order to make the necessary balances. And it is in this state intervention where contradictions exist and where the opportunities or the chances for social transformation especially from the proletarian side, to, be, uh, to, be, to take effect. And so this is very crucial. This is very central 
to the Marxist analysis of capitalism. And uh, that's the reason why I'm, you know, I'm surprised, I'm struck by, you know, uh, by what you said. We can forget the global financial crisis. It's the crisis. Uh, okay. It's at the core of Marxist theory. Crisis is at the core of Marxist theory. The question is, what kind of crisis is the global financial crisis? And of course, you're actually right. I've, I've exaggerated the insignificance of the global financial crisis in order to highlight the broader and deeper transitions that are taking place. But of course, if you live in Greece or Spain or Portugal, it's a dramatic confrontation between capital and labor. The whole model of development is up for grabs. The striking thing you, and the disappointing thing you'll notice about the class struggles, you can imagine Marx was around today, wrote the classic class struggles in France, uh, in relation to the 1840s, would write the class struggles in Greece or Spain or Portugal, would have been very optimistic about the possibility of being a real turning point in the class relations in those countries. But it hasn't turned out that way. Despite all the pink tide in Latin America, despite all the uh, movements across the, uh, you know, movements many of you may belong to, trying to resist these changes, Despite the catastrophic collapse of production in Spain, Portugal, Greece, the capitalists have got the other hand. It, have not been, it has not been possible to reject or overthrow the broadly neoliberal solutions that have come down. So I would say you're right, of course. In the context of the global changes that are taking place, of course the global financial crisis is significant. It's wanting to highlight really the point that it's only a crisis for a small part of the global economy, although it's an important one. But the way to reincorporate it into my analysis is to see it precisely as part of a broader and longer trend, in which case, it, in due course, it will make sense. And when people look back on the global financial crisis, I do think they will see it as part of this turning point in world history where capitalism changed direction, changed ownership, and where those regions of the formerly dominant regions in the global capitalist economy, so you and me both probably, we find it hard to imagine a world in which the United States is not the world's leading capitalist economy. And in some ways it still is. But anyone who thinks that capitalism is Western, and that the global financial crisis is a crisis of Western capitalism and therefore potentially fatal for capitalism, then I think you're wrong. And that was the thrust of my bending the stick a bit towards uh, dynamic growth in the rest of the world rather than... I take your point all the time. Well, from my uh, <coughs> knowledge of Martin Zister, I can say that the lecture of the... Oh, <coughs> from my little knowledge of the Martian system, I think I can say that uh, the lecture given by the professor is one of the most enlightening I have heard. Nevertheless, having said that, I cannot help but disagree at some points in the lecture. <clears throat> the first two points raised uh, by the professor in the bullet, the very first projection, mm -hmm. where you say that the uh, logos of production and of trade is shifting away from the advanced country stores energy. I can agree with that. Now, the second bullet. Nevertheless, the income is shifting away from labor and towards capital. Now, there is an analytical problem there which needs to be addressed. If production and trade is shifting to the emerging economies, you would expect that this effect, the effect of this would be to uplift the incomes of those people. But bullet number two is saying that no, the income stream is going against the working class. So there is need to reconcile here. In fact, Marx reconciled it by saying that the rate of exploitation intensifies. All right? And because that rate intensifies, this is not contained in uh, volume one. But his conclusion was in the critic, where he says that the, what I call this, uh, capitalism, you know, contains its own great diggers. 
they exploited, they blah, 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 ex expropriate these workers. All right. There is a revolution. That's not contained in the academic magnum opus. It's in the polemical part, a paper, the critic of the Gotha program. Now, <coughs> now, the lecture of the professor, it follows. The, the rest of it was to illustrate the increasing dominance of capital in just about everything, mm -hmm. including dominance over the financial institutions, etc., etc. Well, my, res my response to that is that could we have expected otherwise? Capital is dominant by definition. It will dominate everything, including thinking. Of course, the thinking, there are exceptions to that. That is the beauty of the scientific heart. It can be independent of the real forces of uh, obtaining an objective reality. Point number one, I think the uh, logical conclusion is the Martian one, which I was saying you did not make explicit. Now, then, not making it explicit, when the revolution took place, it was not in the advanced countries where the rate of exploitation was very high. On the contrary, it took place in the hinterlands. You know, areas where Marx said that, uh, you know, the, ur the rural uh, production mode, which was the, uh, he characterized it as the symbolic of rural idiocy. That is where the revolution took place. All right, now, secondly, <coughs> the critical Marx, especially in his early writings, how he despised you know, the socialist of those days, inventing, in fact, the, the, ris the derisive term, utopian socialist. That was how he looked at them, with utter academic contempt. Who thought, he said, that they could replace the real forces of production with emotional, religiosity type of thing, we all love each other, remove the exploitative fundamentals of capitalism, we'll all be all right. No. Things did not turn all right. They became worse. Finally, the Industrial Revolution is the professor outlined in brilliant form. Now, <clears throat> so, the replacement of the classical Adam Smith motivation of capitalism that it is not to the benevolence of the butcher that we owe the meat on our table, but to his self-interest. It is not self-interesting, it's generous, even to this day, repugnance to people who have a sense of uh, sympathy with their fellow men. So we are not ready to accept self-interest. Even if the Smithian argument contained in that 1,000 page book, I have read that, Professor, as well as the three volumes of Marx. So, so, yeah, so, <coughs> Because of that, the, uh, the, the idea that we, uh, human beings, decent ones, would like to replace this absolutely selfish uh, love of self to be the motivating force for the organization of society. It is that repugnance that, in fact, drove the Russian revolution and its leaders into mathematical planning See, to replace self-interest in the organization of uh, economic activity. Well, we all know now that did not succeed. Now, consider, for example, the Chinese learning their lessons from the Russians. What did they do? They wanted, they replaced <coughs> selfish interest as a motivating uh, motiv uh, motive of uh, economic activity with what? Moral incentives. Recall? Those of my colleagues here, yeah, you know, they will know this. It's from them that they learned about it. Replacement of the selfish motive with moral incentives. And the sense of uh, organization. The Chinese even replaced, they abolished ranks. So there was no more captain of the no, only so called persons of responsibility. But we all know that also came to naught. All right, so what's the point here? The point here is that the effort to replace the basic motivation that Adam Smith pointed out, all these efforts have failed. 
Today, we see societies that try to adapt the socialist structure to replace the exploitative capitalist system, all of them, with the exception of Cuba, have already shifted back to capitalism. A retreat which earlier, in earlier years I thought will never happen, on the thinking that people will never agree to slavery after they have enjoyed freedom. That sound reasoning at that level, but empirical reality has shown that, aha, uh -huh, really? I have not heard of any capitalist country turning into socialism, especially in these last two decades. Point. I'm an admirer, I'm an admirer of, the social, uh, of the Marxian critique of capitalism. In fact, in economics, we have mathematical proofs of its breakdown. That is how solid it is, theoretically speaking. But on the other hand, despite this theoretical soundness of the Marxian system, how come the whole world, as a matter of historical reality, seems to be moving in the direction which the Marxian system has failed to predict? I think this is a challenge to academics. Okay. See? Well, you see, folks. That's what I've been talking about. Exactly what I've been saying is that if you read what Marx and Engels wrote correctly, they say very clearly there can be no prospect of a, of a revolution until the world market is complete and the proletariat is global. That was their, right or wrong, that was their idea of a scientific conclusion from their premises. So they would have, they obviously had to temporize a bit, but they would have said, Russian Revolution, bound to fail. The American Revolution, bound to fail. And right, you know, so I think what you've, the way you've outlined it, the failure of those revolutions against our hopes and expectations, they confirm that there is something in that very cold and, uh, and deterministic statement, if you like, that until the world market is complete and proletarianization is global, there will be no universal class capable of overthrowing capitalism. So who knows, maybe they're right. I don't, I don't, I'm not very dogmatic myself. I think you go back, I, I do recommend, certainly read the seven volumes of Adam Smith and the three volumes of Capital. Adam Smith is beautiful to read, very, very clear and interesting. But just go and read the German ideology chapters that I've been drawing And remember that when Marx and Engels wrote them, they were in their 20s, they were students like you, most of you. They were trying to make sense of a world that nobody understood. So you can't pin them down to every single detail and say, well, that was untrue 300 years later, so they're mistaken. It is a brilliant, brilliant intuition about the world as it might develop if capitalism became global. It's now becoming global. And I am saying to you, there is no better way of understanding it than through the categories they developed. But of course they say everywhere they write, nothing happens overnight. Nothing is determined in advance. Everything depends upon the struggles that develop around these developments. They're very powerful developments now on behalf of global capital. They can be resisted. They may not be overthrown, but you can change the character of society. Say we agree that for the foreseeable future, capitalism is globally dominant. You can still make it better or worse by the struggles that you engage in. It is a good thing that with uh, radical and with less radical motivations, girls get better chances in school than they used to. Women are more employable than they used to. There's a logic of capital behind that, but there's also a, le a degree of emancipation if you know enough to know when you're being exploited. So nothing in this is deterministic. But I do, I do think that we need to look afresh at the scientific framework that Marx and Engels were trying to devise at the early stage of the Industrial Revolution. And I'll leave you with time to stop with just one pinpointing idea, which is if the Industrial Revolution that they were witnessing, was Engels was in Manchester, wrote the condition of the working class about the Manchester experience. If the Industrial Revolution that they experienced was as important as they thought it was, 
So Marx says world history starts today with this industrial transformation in the northwest of England. Then the thought I leave you with is the spread of that revolution to be global, which is the next stage they envisaged, is equally important. This is not necessarily the end of history. It's not predetermined what happens from now on. But the, but the globalization of industrial markets, the completion of the world market, the concerted attempt to proletarianize the majority of the world's population that is just underway, this is a really important, fundamental, world historical turning point. You're privileged, some of you at least, to have 50 or 80 years to observe it. I don't know, as you say, how much we'll observe in the next 20, 30 years, we'll wait and see. You are living at a moment of really transformative change in world history. And there's another concluding point I could make, Mark says somewhere else, doubt everything. Don't, whatever your teachers say, this professor, that professor, we don't know any more than you do. Nobody has yet grasped what's going on in the world and how to understand it. I've got an offer, I'm offering you a way of looking at it, classical Marxism. I think it's fantastic. You might find a better way. Don't trust me, don't trust anybody else. Just be humble and try to understand without preconceptions how the world is changing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tama. Now we have reached the end of our uh, time period. Rather than try to provide a synthesis, I think we can. Okay. Uh, I can stay and talk. We can stay, yeah, maybe for some of us we can stay. On. Uh, I don't know if the students have any other classes for. But uh, those of you who want to stay on, I think we can still entertain it. Maybe not as formal in a manner, but we can questions. So. So I think we can continue for the as always we're, we're privileged uh, that you're here and we, we hope you you continue coming on this thing um, I uh, I would like to to make some queries and comments uh, regarding the financial crisis I think uh, we cannot just we cannot just dismiss this. In fact, uh, this part of a multiple crisis that we have now, which is so unprecedented, the environmental crisis, for example, which is already endangering uh, humanity, and also uh, the social crisis, which is which is also which has become so so seen and also unprecedented. In Asia, for example, you have 900 million in extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. And uh, they say that 60 to even 70% are already in the informal sector. Mm -hmm. That means uh, they have very subhuman working and living conditions. You know? so, uh, uh, so we have the resurgence of movements uh, against uh, inequality uh, all over the world, uh, especially in, even in the, in the affluent countries in the, in the US, for example, where uh, there is already the, the call to, to, to reverse the 1% versus the 99%. And, uh, and uh, they say also that these are, in a way, anti-capitalist, uh, if not anti neoliberal and uh, uh, we have also uh, 
these, these movements, even in, in Asia, are already calling really for fundamental social economic rights, like living wages and job guarantee and decent work, the end to contractualization, uh, the access to very basic services, and even in the affluent countries, in the welfare states, that these uh, basic services have been dismantled and are being uh, attacked now. You know? So uh, these, these movements are continuing and, and developing. And uh, there is also the, the call to reclaim the states, because it has shown by after the financial crisis that even in the advanced, uh, in the affluent uh, countries, these states have been captured by big capital. Uh, they called for austerity measures at the expense of people. So uh, this, is, this is a very historical moment, and uh, uh, capital will, will continue. But uh, don't you think that there are cracks already? And, uh, and, and I want to ask you, so what do you what is the potential of this precariat now? This uh, the majority of the working people. What is their potential as revolutionary agents of, of change, as, as Marx said, the proletariat? Okay. Uh, are, are the active the agents for, for change? Well, so, if, um, yeah. Here's, here's the problem that I see from the point of view of people who don't want to see just reform, but to see radical transformation. Is that if you are an informal worker in, say, the Philippines, or if you are a factory worker in China living in a dormitory and you've migrated 2,000 miles and you've got no uh, rights or recognition, then the kinds of reforms that offer you uh, the entry to the formal labor market, so recognition of trade unions, negotiating rights over wages, uh, sharing in the in, 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 benefits arising from increased productivity, uh, limited unemployment benefit or pension, these things that improve your working conditions. And they improve your working conditions precisely because 70% of the world's workers are outside the formal labor market and are, in inverted commas, not efficiently exploited by capital. And I guess this might be what, it's wrong to say what Marx had in mind, it doesn't make sense of the idea that until the whole of the global uh, propertyless class is incorporated into the form of proletariat, it's unlikely that advanced workers can lead a revolution because it always benefits the people outside the form of workforce to join it. And they always see that as a form of progress compared to not being exploited by the capital. It's only when you reach a high level of global exploitation and everyone starts to suffer from the same discipline, the same dynamic. Because what we're seeing at the moment is people losing their jobs in Greece or Spain or Portugal because they're unproductive compared to uh, rival companies or countries. But we're also seeing massive, massively across Asia and Africa and Latin America, people joining the world and finding it as a progressive step forward. So there's no common interest between would-be workers in, say, Cambodia and ex-factory workers in Spain. So the, ex the workers in Cambodia might be taking the jobs of the workers in Spain. So I can see the logic of saying there won't be a universal class that has an interest in revolution until there's a universal class. What's that universal class going to be? The proletariat. The trouble is, that's like, I think as you uh, another colleague said, that could be a thousand years. So the question is, what do you do in the meantime to advance radical reforms against the interests of capital? And as you know, because you try much more than I do, it's very, very difficult. <coughs> Most of the gains that we're able to make can at present be incorporated by capital and turned to their advantage. They do also have measurable benefits to large numbers of people. You know, there's no point someone like me coming from Europe and saying, okay, 
Indonesian factory workers may be getting whatever, uh, 50 cents an hour. So that's terrible and they're all being exploited. It's true, but if you've just come from a situation where you had no source of income, and where you had to marry who your father said you did because that was all there was for you to do, it's, a, it's no point me saying to that young woman, don't take this job, you'll be, you'll be exploited by capital. She will say, bring it on. So, yeah, so it's just complicated. And we just, it's, it's, it's what I call the generational uh, aspiration, which is everyone of my generation wanted to see the revolution in their lifetimes. And when it became clear they weren't going to, they got very cross and became near liberals. So they, they, they all joined the stature and said, oh, well, you know, Marxism is a big write-off. But I just say, no, don't count it on the sense of your lifetime. If you're part of a struggle, that one day it will be complete. That's my word. Solidarity. The, 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 the future would have to come from outside the Marxist system. As I think. For it? Yeah. The trigger for the revolution will have to come from outside the formal Marxian system. Oh. It is there. <laughs> that will require, Professor, that will require another lecture from you. <laughs> well, uh, give us yeah. another lecture on that topic. I come back in November. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dr. Kanok is coming back in November and. Again, after that, he will be coming back uh, yes. the next year. So we'll actually have more opportunities to hear from him again and uh, maybe continue this discussion. Uh, there's a lot that he can speak about, and uh, we've just seen one aspect of it. So anyway, uh, perhaps at this point, we can now close the session. Thank you very much for staying on. And let's listen to